Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and of course, uh, thank you, Terrapin, for inviting me, and thank you all for giving me the opportunity to share some of my views with you this morning. Of course, I have a soft heart for the Middle East because I was just checking in this morning in the hotel, and then uh, the uh, concierge asked me, have you ever been to Dubai before? So I said, yes, before you are born. And indeed, I, I came here in 1974 for the first time, and there was really practically nothing here. And uh, since then, obviously, the whole region has developed immensely. And I had the privilege to visit most Middle Eastern countries, including Iran and Syria. And so I have, uh, say, had a very, very nice experience in this region that was also culturally extremely uh, interesting. And that is frequently overlooked by uh, Western observers of the Middle East. But I'm not here to talk about the past. Essentially, I started to work in 1970 on Wall Street, and then in 73 I moved to Asia, and ever since I lived in Asia. But one thing I just wanted to point out, because it relates to the presentation I'm making, in 1970 there was not a single investment bank that was a, a public company. All of them were private partnerships. And this is important to understand, if you have a private partnership, the risk profile or the risks the partners will take are, of course, of a different nature than if you play with other people's money. And so the whole culture of the investment business has changed enormously, whereas a, a partner was liable with all his assets for also the other people's mistakes. Uh, today, essentially, if you're running a bank and you run it like a hedge fund, like Citigroup or so, and you go bust, essentially, it doesn't hurt you. So that has changed a lot in the financial service industry, and I'll talk about this in a second. What I'd really like to demonstrate today is that uh, the Keynesians, their idea is to intervene into the free market, into the capitalistic system with fiscal and monetary measures. And their idea, or the idea of Keynes, was to smoothen out the business cycle. But I'd like to demonstrate that actually with these interventions, the business cycle has become more violent. We have more extreme fluctuations in economic activity. And we have far more uh, financial volatility. The central problem is that the Keynesians always try to address long-term structural problems with short-run fixes and uh, the emphasis on creating bubbles to help the economy, whereas uh, the fact is that bubbles usually hurt the majority of market participants. To better understand this, the Federal Reserve's philosophy has been essentially over the last 30 years that you can't identify bubbles. But if a bubble bursts, you can undertake uh, measures that will support asset prices. In other words, in the words of Mr. Bernanke, you can flood the system with liquidity by dropping dollar bills onto the United States. And that will prevent uh, deflationary recessions from happening. I'd just like, as an aside, to mention that deflation is not necessarily bad. It depends on many other factors. But the point is, over the last 25, 30 years, each time there was a problem, the Fed slashed interest rates and injected liquidity into the system, starting with the SNL crisis in 1990, the tequila crisis in 94. And in particular, LTCM in uh, 98, when they bailed out, LTCM gave a green signal to Wall Street, leverage up, you will be bailed out. One talked about the Greenspan put, and when Mr. Bernanke became Fed chairman in 2006, the view was that there would be a Bernanke put with a higher striking price. So you get the picture. But I'd like to now clearly explain what the problem of dollar dropping is. You drop dollar bills into this room. The Federal Reserve or any other central banks, and the others have done the same, the ECB and now the Bank of Japan and so forth, 
and the Bank of England. The problem is they can drop dollar bills and they can essentially more or less determine the quantity. What they cannot determine is what we will do with these dollar bills. And when you increase the quantity of money, there will be symptoms of inflation. The inflation does not necessarily have to show up in wage inflation in the United States or in consumer price increases in the United States. We drop dollar bills onto this stage. The dollar bills essentially can flow down here or they can flow over there or over there and then they tr can create commodities inflation there or they can create an economic boom here in China with rising wages in China and rising inflation rates in China or they can create a boom in housing over here or in equities over there. That is essentially what's happening and the, the viciousness of this monetary inflation is that when we drop the dollar bills into this room, not every price will go up at the same rate and with the same intensity and at the same time. So what we will have is say you have first have a Nasdaq bubble, 98 to 2000, March 2000, whereas uh, when uh, essentially the Nasdaq between August 99 and March 2000 doubled, but Mr. Greenspan couldn't see a bubble. And then the market collapsed, so they slashed the interest rates here from 6.5% down to 1%. And we have the rapid credit expansion, and that created the housing bubble. And so first the Nasdaq bubble, then the housing bubble. The housing bubble also burst, and then they slashed again interest rates here to zero at the present time. And at the same time that they slashed the interest rates in 2007-2008, commodity prices went ballistic to a peak in July 2008 when oil went up from the time they started to cut interest rates here, $78 to $147 in July 2008. And as I mentioned, you in increased the financial volatility by printing money. So from the peak of $147 in July 2008, Oil then dropped within six months to $32 in December 2008. That is the consequences of easy monetary policies. And this genius who populates the Federal Reserve says, if it were possible to take interest rates into negative territory, I would be voting for that. You know what negative interest rates are? Is you have a deposit of $100,000 with a bank, and after a year, you only get back $90,000. But it's been discussed in the economic literature because it would force people to do something with their money. In other words, they wouldn't save it. They would take it out and spend it. But some people would take it out and put it under the mattress and so forth. So it's a little bit difficult to implement practically. But what you can do, and this has happened, and this will be the case for many years to come, is to have negative real interest rates. In other words, here, you have in the 70s negative real interest rates. That was a period of the last big commodities boom with gold going from $35 to $850 an ounce uh, in uh, January 1980. Then we have a period of positive interest rates and then lately we have again negative interest rates. I have to point out to this. The way they calculate here real interest rates, in other words inflation adjusted, they take essentially the consumer price index the consumer price index does not reflect the cost of living increase of the typical household in the United States. I mean, I have really a large readership, and so I ask my readership, if anyone has the feeling that his cost of living are increasing by less than 5%, to please send me an email. So nobody sent an email except one person. He said, my cost of living have dropped 30%. I lost my girlfriend. <laughs> so I sent him an email back and said, you just wait until you see the replacement costs. <laughs> no, but it is a fact. I mean, most people, their cost of living are going much, up much more than what the governments are telling you the rate of inflation is. So we have negative real interest rates. What does it mean for an investor? Negative real interest rates mean that essentially if you take a 10 years view and you have cash and you put it 
on deposit, the purchasing power of that cash will go down. In other words, you're guaranteed to lose money. I would also suggest that negative real interest rates are negative for bond prices in the long run. In other words, they are inflationary. On the other hand, they are probably positive for some kind of investments. But as I said, you will have this volatility. NASDAQ first, then housing, commodities, and then the third may be equities in emerging markets or whatnot. But it, the problem for the investor is it doesn't happen all at the same time. The other thing is a client of mine told me, look, if I put my money on deposit, yes, I know I'm losing, say, 3 4% in real terms every year. So the purchasing power drops by 3 4%. Well, it's still better than to give my money to a Swiss bank and they lose 30% per annum. So I said, yeah, probably. <laughs> so you, you understand that is the tricky part. It penalizes also savers, people who have you know, saved all their life to put the money on deposit. They never speculated in their lives. You force them to speculate now. The other unintended consequence of easy monetary policies is that essentially commodity prices in the last few years have gone up more than they would have uh, had interest rates been high in real terms. We have long-term commodity cycles. I don't want to repeat everything here. But basically, these long cycles, these are price cycles, not business cycles. They last 45 to 60 years. And so you have these peaks in commodity prices. And the last peak was here in January 1980. And then we were in a bear market for commodities until 1998. And as a result of the incremental demand uh, coming from China, commodity prices started to go up. But they went up more because of easy monetary policy. So you had a huge boom in some commodities, as uh, we shall see. And that has, of course, also implications socially, because during the rising wave of commodities, you have shortages. And because not every group of a society consumes the same quantity of commodities as a percent of his income, it hurts the lower classes of society more than the well-to-do people, as I shall explain in a second. The next unintended consequence, and I have to re-emphasize this because until, say, two years ago, Hardly anyone talked about excessive credit growth being destabilizing. Here you have debt as a percent of the economy. You can see in the 1920s it went up uh, strongly. And then we had the 1929 crash, so the depression years. And then we have a long period of deleveraging where debt to GDP drops from 186% in 29 to around 140% here. When the US went into World War II in 1942, we were at 140% debt to GDP. And in 1980, we we're still at 140% debt to GDP. But under the influence of these Keynesians, the overall level of debt makes no difference. One person's liability is another person's asset. Go explain that to the Greeks or to the French banks and so forth. Under this influence, Nobody paid any attention to the excessive credit growth that occurred over the last 20 years. In particular, Mr. Bernanke and Mr. Per uh, Greenspan, they totally disregarded this excessive credit growth during the period 2000 to 2007. Credit increased in the US at five times the rate of nominal GDP. And whereas here in 29, we had a debt to GDP ratio of 186%, and now we have a debt to GDP ratio of 379%. The difference, and this is an important point, is in 29, we didn't have Social Security, we didn't have Medicare and Medicaid, and now we have them, and the unfunded liabilities. These are liabilities that are coming due which have not been funded. So if you added these unfunded liabilities, we'd be up there in the fifth floor of this building, debt to GDP. But you, as an investor, you have to think, what are the implications of this? Obviously, in my opinion, the US will continue to pursue expansionary monetary policies. They'll have to monetize 